Hey guys, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So, in this video, uh, I want to spend some time talking about this book. I've mentioned it in a couple of the videos. I've used it as a source in a couple of the videos. Um, and that is Tonio Andrade's The Gunpowder Age, China, Military Innovation, and the Rise of the West in World History. Okay, so based on that title, you probably are assuming by now uh, that it is covering, you know, gunpowder history, the concept of gunpowder empires, so going along with that, probably the Age of Exploration, Chinese history, Western history, uh, and military history, and the history of technology as well. And you're not incorrect. It is. But what makes this book interesting, okay, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, um, is that it's located inside of this broader historiography that deals with this thing called the Great Divergence. So essentially, what the Great Divergence is talking about, what it's trying to answer, is, well, if you look at world history, for a thousand years, roughly, probably a little more, depending on where you choose to start Chinese civilization, China was the dominant civilization in the world, in terms of population, in terms of, uh, you know, economics, military achievement, the, I guess, spread of Chinese civilization across the Eurasian steppe in Southeast Asia, um, in terms of exploration, in terms of the continuity of civilization, China was like the big guy on campus. China was the civilization that if you were going to place a bet in the year 1000 as to which civilization would end up circumnavigating the globe, colonizing the Americas, uh, basically developing the modern world as we understand it today, you would be an idiot to not bet on China. But that's not what happened, right? It was the West, specifically Western Europe, which took that place. So the point of the Great Divergence is, well, if China was this dominating civilization for centuries, if not millennia, what the hell happened? So the Great Divergence talks about, well, if China was the dominant civilization for so long, but after about 1400, 1500, 1600, you know, roughly the West became dominant, well, then what happened? Why was this? Is it really correct in examining this question to, you know, view China as declining or just being partially eclipsed for, like, a critical hundred years or so? There are multiple ways we can address that topic. There are multiple ways we can study it. Um, and probably the two best known ways of doing so are through economics and through military history. So that looks at stuff like wage increases, the rise of unions, uh, patterns of trade, patterns of colonization, guns, definitely, naval technology, definitely, etc. And there's nothing wrong with any of those approaches. But any one approach, and this is where this book comes into play, uh, will necessarily look at specific kinds of evidence, and it will examine the trees instead of examining the forest, as it were. So this is where Tony Andrade's The Gunpowder Age comes into play. Because what it does, okay, is it offers a fairly useful correction to how gunpowder and how the gunpowder age is studied, and through that, it tweaks the traditional argument about the Great Divergence as far as this stuff, gunpowder tech, uh, is concerned. So then that begs the question, well, then what is the traditional argument? The traditional argument basically is this. So gunpowder shows up in Chinese records in, like, the late 800s, early 900s, like that period, around there. After it shows up, the standard narrative um, that most of us learn from, like, textbooks and in, you know, school is that, well, the Chinese didn't really do anything with gunpowder. They made fireworks, they made some explosives, they had kites that used it to freak out nomads. Uh, but gunpowder leaves China, right? This is probably what we all know. And it shows up in Europe by traveling across the steppe and through the Arab empires by like 1200, probably around there. There is an argument for an independent invention that's not really well supported. Basically, the argument is it leaves China, shows up in Europe. Europeans, though, they do the thing that Chinese 
don't do. They use guns to devastating effect. They drastically improve firearm technology, and they use it to help establish both old and new empires in the sense of uh, old imperialism focusing on, like, the Americas, and new imperialism focusing on Africa, Southeast Asia, and East Asia. The Chinese don't use firearms, and when the Europeans get into wars, like the Opium Wars, with China, the Europeans have the better tech, and they win. China, realizing what's happening, in Japan, realizing what's happening, both attempt to reform in the 1800s. So does Korea. China and Korea fail. Japan succeeds. It leads to European and Japanese imperialism in East Asia. So that's the traditional argument. But what Andrade does in this book, okay, and this is what makes it so interesting and so important in this debate, is he takes another look at the evidence, and he looks at more Chinese evidence than had been looked at previously as far as uh, military history is concerned. And he critically evaluates a lot of the present literature on this topic, and he comes to a different conclusion. So what makes this book stand out is not only the research, but because it blends brilliantly um, military, economic, technological, and global history. Typically, in the Great Divergence debate, those things are looked at separately. And in combining them, what he finds is basically as follows. During the Chinese Song Dynasty, East Asia enters a period of what he calls uh, the East Asian Warring States era, in which gunpowder tech plays a key role, especially in the wars between the Song and the Jin dynasties. Um, when the Chinese are fighting in Korea, it makes its way over to Japan. So this is like a gunpowder age in China. The 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, like that period. The Mongols use it, as is fairly well known, uh, to conquer China and to attack Japan. But the Ming Dynasty, which arises in like the mid to late 1300s, which throws the Mongols out, uses gunpowder as well. This is the thing you don't hear too much, and this is what Andrade focuses on in this book. He looked at Ming military manuals. And what the manuals make clear, and he uh, reproduces chunks of them in this book, is that the Ming armies had widespread use of gunpowder units. So cannons, what we would understand to be like uh, musketeers, etc. They're all over the Ming military, and they use it to devastating effect against their enemies to carve out an empire and, in Andrade's view, arguably create the first um, gunpowder empire, or what we know as gunpowder empires, these large states which are able to exist and have armies based around firearm technology. And he also finds that, apparently, during the Ming Dynasty, this thing called rotating volley fire, this idea where you have, like, a line of uh, troops, and you see in, you know, like, pop culture movies like The Patriot or anything involving, like, the American Revolution or the French and Indian War, there are, um, you know, these rows of infantry on one side and rows of infantry on another, and they're just shooting at each other. That's not what you're supposed to do. The way this technology worked itself into the military was called rotating volley. So you have a body of infantry arranged in uh, rows and columns. And what this is supposed to be, and this is what movies get wrong, is that the guy in front shoots, and he either reloads while the guy behind him shoots, or he shoots and he goes to the back of the line and people just rotate. So it's rotating volley fire. This was believed to have been invented uh, by the Dutch and then definitely perfected by the Swedes in like the 1600s-ish. What Andrade finds through studying Ming military manuals is they developed this about 150 years before this thing shows up in Europe. And that's Amazing. But then we're back to the same old question. If China was advanced militarily, and they were, technically speaking, you know, they had a better military, quote-unquote, than Europe in, like, the 1500s, why are they dominated in the 1700s and in the 1800s? Right, so we're back to the old question. If China was managing to use guns effectively, what the heck happened? Well, in order to figure that out, Andrade goes through and he tabulates 
maybe not all of them, but the majority of the wars fought in uh, East Asia and in Europe between like 1500, when the West supposedly in you know the Great Divergence debate takes off, and about 1800, when China begins to fall under European domination. So what's his entry here? And his entry is a play on the traditional, um, you know, the West rose because there was no unified empire, so states were in competition line of argument. Based on his tabulation of wars, what Andrade discovered, and as far as I'm aware, uh, he's the only person to really have done like statistics like this, what he finds is that European states enter a 150-ish to 200-ish year period of really intense, horrific warfare based around gunpowder tech, with the key wars here being the Thirty Years' War, which potentially killed uh, more people than any war up to World War I. I have to double check that, so don't quote me. Uh, the French Wars of Religion and the Swedish Deluge, this, uh, this term for this massive period of Swedish military intervention and armed conflict in, like, Poland, the Baltic states, and a little bit of Russia, which, if you study Russian history, is one of the uh, starting points of Muscovite state centralization, which leads to the Russian Empire. So it's this key period. At just the same time, this is, like, the crux of his argument. At just the same time that this is going on, these wars are taking off in... Uh, Europe. The Ming Dynasty largely pacifies continental East Asia, and then they're conquered by the Qing, and although, you know, there are rebellions and stuff, the Qing basically pacify continental East Asia. So that region is at peace. Now, with that said, let me step back for a second and also say that this doesn't necessarily mean East Asia was, like, entirely at peace. Gunpowder technology in Europe and Asia in about the 1600s roughly reaches what Andrade calls an age of parity, when both regions are uh, technologically matched for about a hundred year period in the 1600s. So in East Asia, this is the end of the Japanese warring states, the uh, Sengoku Jidai, the Imjin War, when the Japanese attempt to conquer Korea, and then hopefully through there China, the Qing conquest of China, and the subsequent pacification of uh, Ming Rebellion. So it's this rough period where there is some armed conflict going on in East Asia, but as that ends, towards the end of the 1600s, European wars increase in frequency, and in the 1700s, we get stuff like the Seven Years' War, and then in the 1800s, early 1800s anyway, uh, we get the Napoleonic Wars, both of which led to massive military innovation and massive technological development in Europe. So this leads European military tech right to progress, according to Andrade, just enough, just enough, just a little bit, that it can beat East Asia's tech for just the right amount of time. This is key to his argument. China had no need to develop more military tech because it reigned supreme. If there was a problem, they could, you know, at least in theory, quash it like a mosquito. In this study, Tony Andrade also looks at um, fortifications, and he observes that the Europeans and the Chinese built very different types of walls, which were going to affect the, uh, well, effectiveness of gunpowder against fortifications, on the battlefield, etc. So the Chinese walls are thicker or tend to be thicker, they tend to be a little shorter, they're packed with earth, so they're able to withstand gunpowder. They also develop what looks like a Chinese version of the Star Fort, this uh, key piece of military architecture in the gunpowder age. European walls at the end of the Middle Ages aren't constructed in this way. Therefore, gunpowder, like artillery, can destroy them. Once they build star forts, though, Europe enters this period um, of really intense military competition, and they develop warfare in the way they do, specifically because the forts are so difficult to attack and conquer. People think about, you know, in pop culture, the medieval period is like the era of cavalry? Not really. It's the early modern period that sees cavalry rise to dominance in more ways than one. Why? Because cavalry are swift, they're fast moving, and they can, on the battlefield, go knock out artillery. Wars in Europe also grow more expensive, and because of that we see the rise, and this is also key to the Great Divergence, we see the rise of states like France or England uh, over leagues of city-states. 
due to the need for effective fiscal and tax structures to fund the wars. There's an entire war in this period fought over one city, Metz, and it's incredibly expensive and it lasts like five years. So wars are getting more intense, but the objectives are getting smaller. Now with all of that said, the book ends on a rather interesting note for both history and for uh, political science. So you can make a very strong argument, and Andrade does to an extent, that because the West destabilized China in the late 1700s, in the 1800s, and then, you know, after China breaks up during the 1911 revolution and we get the era of warlords, right? This is like the early 20th century. Um, if you play Hearts of Iron, you definitely know what this map looks like of China. In the late 1800s, Japan sees what's happening. They say, oh crap, if we don't westernize, if we don't modernize, what's going on to China could potentially happen to us. So Japan revolutionizes itself and they modernize along uh, western lines very quickly. Well, China's not unified, so there's another East Asian power, Japan, that steps into the vacuum, and they achieve global power status specifically because China's not there to stop it. If China had been unified and not divided, well, then potentially we could see the Greater East Asian War, so that is, you know, World War II and the Sino-Japanese War combined in East Asia, 1937 to 1945. If that was even going to be fought, if there was a unified China, we could see it have played out very differently. Um, and then, with the unification, Andrade argues, of China in the post-war period under Mao and the Communists, it is entirely possible that we've entered a new global warring states period. And that's the key aspect of the end of the book and its argument. So guys, if you are interested in this stuff, this is one of the first things you should pick up. Actually, it is probably the first thing you should pick up. So I hope you all enjoyed. And if you're interested, like I said, definitely get it. Take care, guys, and I'll see you all next time. Done.